Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know by now, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons designed by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons is for the first three months of 2014. It's a series of lessons entitled Discipleship. And this is the last lesson in that series entitled The Cost of Discipleship. It's lesson number 13 for March 29 of 2014. If you were interested at all in getting these materials that we use in our lessons, um, you can find them at the place shown on your screen, Theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, um, well, our website, and th the handouts we use will be, will be there and available. So the cost of discipleship, is that a high cost, low cost, what do you think? Well, before we jump into our Bibles, and I hope you have your Bible handy because we're going to look at a number of verses, but before we do that, would you be willing to bow your heads with us as we pray for the Holy Spirit's guidance? Our loving Father, we thank you for the words of instruction and guidance that we've been given in Scripture and from other inspired sources, from pastors and others who would like to see us join them in finishing the gospel. But the problem is many of us aren't sure exactly what to do. We don't know how much the cost of discipleship might be. And then we have other things we think we need to do. So Lord, help us to realize after our, in our study today what it really costs and why it's important for us to get on with the task. Send us your Holy Spirit to guide as we think about these things as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when Jesus was here on this earth, he was persecuted. He was, well, we know he was finally killed. He was crucified. And his disciples, as far as we know, all but one of the 12 disciples, except, of course, leaving Judas out, um, were, were martyred. John is the only one who apparently lived out a full life. And it wasn't because they didn't try to kill him. They tried to kill him on several occasions, tried to get rid of him, etc. Well, <clears throat> what about us today? Have any of us suffered? Have we been crucified or beheaded or thrown to the lions or any of those things that used to happen? Have we lost jobs? Have we been ridiculed? Have we been thrown out of our families? Those things just seem remote, like that couldn't happen here, right? Well, <clears throat> there's an interesting verse that we need to look at. Look at 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. Everyone. Now, how many does that include? There's everyone. Not, everyone. All of us. Everyone. everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Does that mean only in the days of Jesus and the days of Paul? Does that mean all the time? And, well, it and doesn't say all the time. How... how <laughs> How fierce or how intense is that persecution? Well, I mean, might, we might say, well, it, that's against the law now. Well, you can't torture people. You know, persecution comes in all kinds of different. Um, that's true. Strengths. Um, I mean, sometimes I think my kids persecute me. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they probably think you persecute them. <laughs> well. Or do we, do we dare suggest that it might be because we're not living godly lives in Christ Jesus? Well, I thought, I thought you get persecuted because of that. Well, that's what I'm saying. So, so if we're not living godly lives, then we don't get persecuted. So we're living comfortably. Um, well, you know, when you started, started talking about this stuff, it, it sounded like it was something that was important, that it should be happening to us. Is that, is that what you're trying to get across? Well, I think you'll get that message by the time we get to the end of this lesson. It, it certainly is an indicator. Yes. So, are, do you, but let's, you're a Christian, do you, do you turn into a masochist or something? Well, or? hold on, hold on a minute. You know that there's a lot of pastors out there on television, some of them 
pastors to mega churches that are doing very well financially. And they seem to be preaching what we sometimes call a health and wealth gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a good Christian, God will bless you and you'll have a nice car and you'll live in a wonderful house and you'll have all that you need. You won't have to worry about retirement, etc. Is that what uh, Jesus is suggesting? Sounds pretty opposite to what Jesus said and Paul said, doesn't it? I think in our lifetimes we've been fortunate to be where we are. The current estimate of persecution of Christians right now in the, in the world is 200 million minimum. Yeah. It's not here, but it could be, but for a quirk of fate that we were born here. Well, I, I had a professor one time here at this university that used to ask a question in one of his classes that we need to think about. He said, which doctrines of the church would you be willing to die for? Hmm. You're so sure that this is true that you would be willing to die for it. Well, it must be the doctrine that you'll be raised again. Well, that must be the truth right there, because if it wasn't anything else, well, then why would you even want to die? <laughs> think about the story of the disciples. Yeah. On crucifixion weekend, they were petrified. They were scared to death, you know, huddled almost in a corner in a locked room for fear they were going to be the next ones to be arrested. And a few weeks later, what happened? They were fronting off the Sadducees and Pharisees. And, and they were pointing their fingers right at him and said, you crucified the Son of God, the one who was supposed to be the Messiah. What happened? Well, look at some verses. Let, let's, uh, let's be blunt here. Look at Luke 12, starting with verse 49. I came to set the earth on fire. This is Jesus talking. And how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism to receive and how distressed I am until it is over. Do you suppose that I came to bring peace to the world? No, not peace, but division. From now on, a family of five will be divided, three against two and two against three. Fathers will be against their sons and sons against their fathers. Mothers will be against their daughters and daughters against their mothers. Mothers-in-law will be against their daughters-in-law and daughters-in-law against their mothers-in-law. Does that sound like the gospel that we give lip service to every Sabbath? Sounds like a prescription for divorce court. Yeah. Did Jesus, I mean, is this, is, was he just, you know, hyping things up here or, or is this real? Well, let me ask you a question. If you were trying, if you knew about the gospel, mm -hmm. what would you do to make people take it seriously? I mean, what would you say to them to say that, oh, I'll do this if I feel like it or if my wife doesn't give me a bad time? or something like that. I mean, what would you say to make you fortified to, to take it so seriously that um, you will put it ahead of your life, yeah. you know, type of thing? I think you would say that very same thing that Jesus said. I think that's mm -hmm. what you would do to make sure that the, the thing is important, that it is... Now, you're not, you're not trying to imply that Jesus was sort of being deceptive. No, no, not at all. But okay. Just, but oh, if I it's want to be important, sure. if it's important, well, then it's important than anybody. It's important than your your parents. It's more important than your friends. It's more important than anything, you know. But don't haven't we? I mean, don't we believe that Christians should be the best husbands and the best wives, the best fathers, the best mothers, the best children of anybody around? Well, that's that's it, isn't it? I mean, but we you want to do that. We do live in the middle of a great controversy, and this is not a pretend war. This is a real war. Yeah, that's true, and that's why it's important. That's why it's... Well, if you're <clears throat> going to take that really quite seriously, you probably shouldn't get married at all. Well, that's well, what the what disciples said, wasn't it? That's what Paul said. There's your example. I mean, sure, that's exactly <laughs> what they said. But Peter, I don't think Peter would agree with that, would he? No. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you suppose was the response when Jesus told his disciples that the gospel might separate them from their families? It was probably something they hadn't heard before. Well, listen to this. 
Try to imagine how this would be reported. I, I've suggested the, t this to you before on some other occasions. How would this re be reported on a modern television newscast? Okay, imagine here I am. I'm, I'm an announcer on a national TV program. Today, celebrated religious leader Jesus of Nazareth advocated familial hatred during his afternoon address. Analysts are comparing these current pronouncements with previously released statements that promoted loving relationships with neighbors and even enemies. Informed commentators wonder if this indicates recent policy shifts. Other unconfirmed quotations suggest selling everything and turning the proceeds over to the Jesus movement. Stay tuned for further developments. What would you say if you heard something like that on morning well, news? Jesus is telling his disciples this. What, <coughs> what, is he, what is he saying here to these, to these people? Um, certainly this would not be a message to a family which has embraced Christianity. You're not going to be telling your family which... Um, um, who come together because of this Messiah and the message that he's preaching, he's not, he wouldn't be telling that to the... He's got to be telling them that <clears throat> that um, this doctrine and this message that they're going to be teaching is new and it's going to create some division uh, where it's new. It even... I mean, if you take the, the language seriously, there's some of the Gospels that actually said, you're going to hate the, your, your family members. L look, look at, maybe, let's, let's understand that. Look at Deuteronomy 21, 15. Suppose a man has two wives and they both bear him sons, but the first son is not the child of his favorite wife. Now, I need to read this from the King James uh, so that you'll understand what this is. If a man hath two wives, one beloved and another hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated, and if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, and then it goes on and talks about so forth. Did, did this guy, it was this guy, I mean, in those days you could just say, be divorced, be divorced, be divorced, and they're gone. So would someone stay married to someone he hates? What, well, what's what's I going don't know. on here? What do they mean by hate? Isn't it just. Well, that's a, the question. Isn't that just a kind of a. The translators use to make something less valuable than the other person? Okay. Well, the modern translations, like my one, my Good News Bible that I read to you, have translated this not as hated, but as disliked in some cases or unloved. Uh, and that seems to be clearly what Jesus intended because look at Matthew 10 37. It says, Those who love their father and mother more than me are not fit to be my disciples. It doesn't say those who hate their fathers and mothers. Those who love their son or daughter more than me are not fit to be my disciples. So clearly, it seems to be talking about loving less, not, not hating in the full sense of the word that, word that we might use it today. Oh, but he's would, still why would, demanding that. Why would someone love their family more than they love Jesus? Well, an example might be <clears throat> on, on, on an evening, uh, you have an opportunity to go out and witness. There's a team from your church going out to witness. But you decide you'd rather stay home because this is the this is a night your kids are home from school. Is that a good thing, a bad thing? Depends on the situation. Sure. So Well, what is Jesus really saying? Is it possible that Jesus really meant that if our family receives precedence over him and he becomes secondary, he is no longer Lord in our lives? Well, and then once again, what you're asking is precedence. You know, your family, that's part of your discipleship too. Sure. And, and that's one of the questions that, that needs to be asked. I mean, obviously, if you're talking about dealing with your family, the ideal thing is to have your family move together, do this together. Whatever you're doing, do it together, right? And there is a, a story where Jesus met, um, it's not the rich run, not the rich, not the rich young, young yeah, ruler. It, it was yeah. another similar story, and I can't think of exactly what the details were, but <clears throat> the young man was told to, um, maybe it's Old Testament story, to um, uh, come and, and follow, and he wanted to stay, and there was a wedding or something that he was wanting to do. Is this an Old Testament well, there's story? There's a New Testament story where he says, uh, 
you know, let me go and bury my father. Right, yes. Uh -huh. uh, and Jesus says, and, and, you know, you need to understand that story in the context. How, how long do Jews wait to bury, their rel bury someone who dies? Same day. Within 24 hours. So the guy is, the father's not dead. So what he's saying is, let me go home and maybe sometime in the future when my father dies and I don't have any more responsibilities at home, I'll come and follow you, Jesus. And Jesus said, I'm not going to be here very much longer. If you're going to follow me, you're going to follow me now. Your father will survive. Probably be there when you go back, get back. Well, Jesus has told us that we can't serve more than one master. Does, how far should we go, carry the idea that loving God unreservedly must be first and foremost in our lives? Do we agree that discipleship exacts the supreme price, undivided loyalty to Christ? What, what does it mean in the 21st century, in our country, for example, what does it mean to put Christ first in our lives? Well, one thing for sure, he's the creator. It, everything comes from him already. Yeah. So, um, if you like water, he's the source. Mm -hmm. He's the well. If you like family, he's the well. Mm -hmm. it, they, it all came from him. But if you get to the point where the family starts getting more important and that source gets less important, it just seems kind of not do, right. Do any of us focus more time and attention on our jobs, our houses, our new cars than we do on Jesus? Well, yeah, it's just priorities. Possibly. It's priorities, isn't it? Because you can ask well, the same thing about your about. life. Yeah. Isn't that what we're talking about here? That is. He is the creator. He, mm -hmm. he is where everything comes from. The first commandment says to love him mm -hmm. first. And it's because he's the creator, yeah. and he's the one that can restore anything that's gone. So Okay, so let's go to this verse, Luke 14, 27. Those who do not carry their own cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. Now this whole series of lessons is about being Jesus' disciples, right? Who, what does it mean to... Who is he talking to here? Not to us, surely. <clears throat> well, but, <laughs> you know, if a mother decides that she needs to be like Paul, mm -hmm. and a father decides he needs to be like Paul, then the children are left without parents. That's right. So, um, it, it may depend on your calling. Well, l l let's, I mean, and this is what we're talking about here. What is the relationship between cross-bearing and, let's say, the doctrines of the church, the other doctrines? I don't understand your question. Rephrase it. Well, okay. It, it, does, does, I mean, we, we think that, okay, we need to keep the Sabbath, we need to pay tithe, we need to da-da-da, you know, we need to believe that God is, you know, supreme ruler. and We have, we have 28 doctrines, and we believe those. And I asked a little while ago, you know, how many of those doctrines would you be willing to die for? We think those are important. The church votes on them. We think they're important. But it, are we, are, I mean, at general conference time, will we stand up and say, okay, how many of you are for cross-bearing and how many of you are for doctrines of the church and think that we need to keep the Ten Commandments? I mean, well, there, there are some who take into question the validity of those 20... <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. hey, so, are, 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 if they're if they are of the viewpoint that <clears throat> there's something erroneous in those, should they, you know, become another Paul over these things? Yeah. To me, the statement that's made there, you, you've got to be able to bear your own cross, seems to me that the bottom line here is like Job. You've got to have made up your mind that you're prepared to forego all, including your own life and your family. Well, is, is living a cross-bearing life legalistic? I mean, is this, is this for masochists? It could be, but it doesn't have to be, and I don't think it's supposed to be. Can you, can you uh, amplify and illuminate more this term cross-bearing? Okay. 
Let me, let, let's, let's take, sometimes you can understand better something if you give a contrast. There are many people who would say today, God offers salvation free to all. He's accomplished everything on our behalf. All we have to do is receive it. Does that sound like any cross-bearing? Well, to me, cross-bearing is, is, is not necessarily something really big. I mean, I hate to wash dishes, mm -hmm. but, <laughs> exactly. but I like to eat on clean dishes. Uh -huh. So what do I do? I wash the dishes. That's my cross that I'm, I'm paying right there. Now that's something very small, but then it starts going up, you know, as far as significance from washing dishes to something else, clear up to what Jesus did, which was to actually bear the cross, get spit on, and get rejected by everybody, mm -hmm. just to show who he, that he loves us, that there's nothing we can do to make him not love us. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's pretty big right there. But yeah. when you talk about cross bearing, you're talking about a big range of things, I think. Well, let's 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 pick out some of the words that Jesus used. That, that's a good example, right? Luke 21, verses 12 to 19. Before all these things take place, however, you will be arrested and persecuted. You will be handed over to be tried in synagogues and be put in prison. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my sake. This will be your chance to tell the good news. Do we believe that? Make up your minds beforehand not to worry about how you will defend yourselves because I will give you such words and wisdom that none of your enemies will be able to refute or contradict what you say. You will be handed over by your parents, your brothers, your relatives, and your friends, and some of you will be put to death. Everyone will, be hated, will hate you because of me, but not a single hair from your heads will be lost. Stand firm and you will save yourselves. Yeah, well, tell that to the martyrs. Yeah. Well, Someone did. That's why they were martyrs. It's just verified well, yep. how, how serious this whole thing is. I mean... Mm -hmm. but it, if it just said there wasn't going to be a hair on your head that was harmed. Yeah. Well, look at these words. This is John 16, <coughs> verses 1 and 2. Part of Jesus' last words to his disciple on the night before he was crucified. I have told you this so that you will not give up your faith. You will be expelled from the synagogues, and the time will come when anyone who kills you will think that by doing this he is serving God. Is that time going to come? Yeah. It's pretty serious. It's already been here and there for some people. Pretty serious. They will do this because they have not known the Father nor me. Mm -hmm. But they think they do. Yeah. Now over in Revelation, we claim to be a church that understands the book of Revelation. It says in Revelation 14, 4, now this is describing the final group of people. That should be us. It says, they are the men who have kept themselves pure by not having sexual relations with women. They are virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever mm -hmm. He goes. What does it mean to follow the lamb? Who's the lamb? Christ. Okay. The Messiah. And where did he go? Everywhere that needed to be gone. He went to Calvary and he was crucified. Are we prepared to follow him? It says, this says the people who live, the, the true Christians who live at the end are prepared to follow Jesus to the cross. Well, how many people followed him to the cross? actually <laughs> just one yeah just I, one yeah. that's not very encouraging no but i i'm 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 just i'm reading to you from scripture this is god's word but the other thing that happened that those all those disciples came back yeah is it possible that anything like that could happen in a country like the united states where we we believe we have constitutionally guaranteed freedoms yes Oh, it, can ha it can happen any place. They're already starting to nibble at the freedoms. <laughs> well, shall we, re shall we recall the time when the Second World War came along and a lot of Japanese Americans who lived here, maybe were born here, been here all their lives, we weren't sure whether they could be trusted, so we put them in, you know. You can't depend on the U.S. Supreme Court to pre no. preserve your rights. No. Yeah. And look at what happened in the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation back in 
Martin Luther's time and Reformers' time. Well, at what point in the process of bringing new believers into the church should we suggest that they have to bear a cross? Do we go out? I mean, how many people have you stand out, seen standing out on the corner saying, Welcome, welcome, come bear a cross? We don't sort of talk about that up front, do we? Well, the, aren't we really talking about a package thing? I mean, sometimes it isn't bearing the cross like that, but other times it does happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, you gotta you gotta take what comes and and not take. Well, okay. you have to take everything that comes. Yeah. What makes this? We're you know we're we're assuming that this uh, this cross bearing business has to do with just martyrdom. Oh, no. <clears throat> what about? I'm, that's one of the questions I'm asking. What, is, what does what about, cross bearing uh, mean in the 21st century? Yeah, well, maybe it's maybe, maybe I've have. got some personal crosses that I'm not particularly wanting to bear. <laughs> okay. Whether you have a job or not. <clears throat> yeah. Whether you've got to work on a certain day that you feel is wrong. Well, what about this? On the other side, is there anything? I mean, being honest now, is there anything this world has to offer that comes even to close, even close to what Christ has to offer? Yeah. Eternal life, living with God? I think it's easy for some people, probably all of us, one way or another. We all have our weaknesses. It would be comparatively easy to get sidetracked, but in answer to your question, no. We're also assuming that bearing the cross in these troublous times is going to be an uncomfortable experience mm -hmm. when in fact there may be a certain joy, a certain um, Fulfillment? inner peace mm -hmm. that, uh, that comes from knowing that you know, you're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. I, um, <clears throat> of course, now that's kind of hard to accept when your children are suffering because of yeah. Suppose, suppose that you come up with a good idea and you started a business and you became a millionaire and you found out that Jesus was coming in the next month and you had the choice of either giving up everything you own and going with the Jesus or, or, or keeping your millions. Which would you choose? Well, as, as a Christian here, believing what we believe... It's going to depend on your... On your it's the depth of your belief. On, on what you're really attached to. Well, that's why my friend used to say, which one of these ideas would you be willing to die for? You know, it, it's, it's kind of hard to answer those questions because they're so general. Okay. You don't really know. You want. Well, I don't, well, it I don't know. It should be hard. It's, it's just that when you start when you get into a situation where you see the contrast between going this way or that way, you know, you say, I don't want to go this way. There's no way I'm going to go this way. Even if, you, even if I put a gun to your head, even if I put a gun to my head. Now, what are those things that make you want to do that? Just say, using words like cross-bearing and, and the truth and all that, you know, it's, it's, there's, it's a little bit empty, you know. I had a, 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 a classmate from college mm -hmm. who studied theology and became a pastor. And some of you, I think, may have heard this story before. Um, and I don't, can't, don't have nearly time enough to tell you the whole story. But um, he was a pastor in a place in the southern part of the United States. And he was making some real efforts to go out and meet people and spread the gospel and so forth. And, one night, one Saturday night, in the middle of the night, there was a knock on his door. And he went to the door, and just as he opened the door, this guy forced his way in and held him at gunpoint and said, wake up your family, I want him to line up on the, by the wall over there. So he called his family out, what else do you do? The guy's holding you, holding you at gunpoint. He lined up his family over there. He says, now he says, I'm gonna ask you some questions. <laughs> And he, so he started down like, do you believe in God? Do you believe Jesus is coming back again? Da, 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 down the line like this. About 10 questions like that. And of course he said, yes, 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 yes. And so then the guy says, okay. Then he put his gun right up at his head like this. He said, okay, now I'm going to ask you the same questions 
exactly the same questions, and the first time you say yes, I'm going to pull the trigger. And there's his family standing right over there watching. What would you do? Well, what happened, in actual fact, was this. The guy said, do you believe in God? And the pastor said, yes. And the guy took his gun and he threw it across the room. He said, I didn't think there was anyone in the world that really believed anything anymore. And the re even though that guy was a, someone I went to school with, I didn't even hear the story until a few years later. And the newspaper reporter, who was a hard drinking, smoking, cussing kind of a guy who came out to report on this story for the newspaper, ended up being an Adventist pastor, and he was our pastor. So I got this story sort of around, I somehow got it from both ends. But I know this is a true story. And what would we do? I mean, you don't want to die saying you don't believe in God. Well, you know, one, one thing that is, is true, you're not really alone when you're in that situation. Yeah. And you don't know how much the Spirit um, helps you out. Yeah. to make the right decision, especially when you want him to. Hmm. And, um, and so it's kind of hard when you, when you describe that story that we're making the complete decision ourselves. Yeah. You know, there is, there is some strength that comes from the Lord. And, mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. I think that's, that's important. Yeah. Surely that would be a time to have some. <laughs> <laughs> because it would be very easy to conclude that this is a pretty trivial situation, too, if you say no. Then what's he going to do? Is he going to go, okay, see, I told you, and leave? Um, how, how really, you ha that, that's where you have to, to think about well, you how, don't have how, a lot of time to be <clears throat> how important is, is, yeah. it, you know, is this decision? And um, yeah. what if the guy goes away and believing because he said, well, no, I don't really believe that. Um, your family would know the difference, mm -hmm. so uh, you know it's 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 hard, hard to you never know those kinds of situations till you're in them. Well, Paul talks about the challenges that Christians face in First Corinthians nine, starting with verse twenty-four, and of course he talks about winning a race, and he said, "What does he say? He says if you want to win win a, win a marathon, you've got to practice hard, and you've got to do all the right things, and you've got to eat the right stuff, and you've got to, you know, get down to the right weight if you're overweight, and you've got to, you know. And he says, and those people, they do all that to get a woven wreath made out of leaves that's going to fade away. But you know, of course, what they're really fighting for is not the leaves. What they're really fighting for is a reputation. They want to be known as as, as the champions, etc., which is something to so now what about us we we know that if we go through that kind of rigorous training to be christians and we really do it to be christians the kind of christians god wants we can all be winners right i mean will anybody who enters the kingdom of heaven think he's not a winner we'll all think we're winners if we get there so, would it be, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing you, and <laughs> don't, you know, push back if you want, but discipleship is not one thing among many others. But if we are serious about being Christians, following Jesus has to be number one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you, the verses are there. I mean, you know, we can't deny they're there. Now, we might, we might wish we could in, reinterpret them in some way, and a lot of people have, but the verses are there. Is Jesus really asking us to surrender everything to him? Is, is it really true that if we're not willing to give it to him, anything we're not willing to give to him would, could become an idol? When you give it to him, what do you mean by that? Well, at, le at least you're willing to say that following him is more important than that thing. So if he said that you got to get rid of it, like you have to sell all your, all your money, what did he, what did he to say to the rich young me? ruler? Yeah, go so and sell everything you have. He didn't tell his disciples that. 
Well, they didn't have anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not. We don't know that. I think it, uh, it, there are rumors here and there that, that some of those disciples might have had a little more than we get out of here. Well, I don't know, but I, I think of the old hymn, I Surrender All. It's mm -hmm. that simple. Well, a lot of, some of them jumped out of their fishing boats, but there was lots of fish mm -hmm. in yeah. their nets, and they didn't worry well, about the... Well, okay. Let, let's, let's look at it from another perspective. Just a different way to look at the same ideas, maybe. If we say to the, if we kneel down and pray in the morning, say, Holy Spirit, I want you to guide my life today. What, what are we really saying? Is that surrender to Christ? Is that, would that be the same as cross-bearing? Well, sure. you're trusting Him to guide you. If the Holy Spirit really comes into our lives and guides us, what happens? Does, does, are we changed by that? We're changed, but it's not really predictable what's going to happen. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> can't, can't, he, can't he change even our characters? We, you know, the statements, Great Controversy, page 555, by beholding we become changed. If we look to Jesus and we're willing to full, try to pattern our lap after his and we're willing to invite the Holy Spirit in, what happens? Well, looking at that runner's example, Ellen White said these words, the runners put aside every indulgence that would tend to weaken the physical powers and by severe and continuous discipline train their muscles to strength and endurance that when the day of the contest should arrive they might <coughs> put on the heaviest tax, put the heaviest tax upon their powers. How much more important that the Christian whose eternal interests are at stake bring appetite and passion under subjection to reason and the will of God. Never must he allow, that's the Christian, never must the Christian allow his attention to be diverted by amusements, luxuries, or ease. All his habits and passions must be brought under the strictest discipline. Reason, enlightened by the teachings of God's word and guided by his spirit, must hold the reins of control. Acts of the Apostles, page 311. What does oh, that mean? No more golf games, no more going to watch the Dodgers play, no Maybe. more big trips to Hawaii. I just have to, uh, just have to, uh, I don't know whatever I have to do, but it's not going to be a whole lot of fun. I can see that. <laughs> it's got to be. Well, but maybe, <clears throat> maybe your fun is going to become witnessing to others. And you do that on the plane to Hawaii. You do that at the golf course. <laughs> there you go. I haven't done any witnessing in Hawaii. I better get right over there. <laughs> well, but I mean. Just how, how focused, I mean, you know, when you read about Paul, the perception you get is, is um, this gentleman was uh, close to manic about his, uh, <laughs> about his. I don't think he considered it mania. <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm not sure it was that way with... Um, Peter? Um, the little maid and, and mm -hmm. Naaman. Yeah. I'm not sure it was that way with necessarily with Mary or Joseph. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, we read this and we think, we get the impression, oh my goodness, I have to just well be at this like Paul was, you know, I'm, and uh, I don't know, something, I'm not sure that's the correct, the correct I'm, I'm well, pretty he, sure that's the incorrect perception. Okay, but so let's, let's, let's say, can, let's, let's, can we what do we normally do? What do we normally do? Do we read through the Bible when, when we hit one of these verses, well, that, that can't be really serious, and we jump over it and read on. Is that what we're supposed to do? Oh, no, you... You stick with it and figure out what it means. Okay, if you're running a business and you're deciding about taking on some new aspect of the business, and if you're really sophisticated in our time, you're going to run a cost-benefit analysis and you're going to say, okay, if I do this, is it going to, is it going to benefit my country, my, my company long-term? We do all those kinds of things. What about our Christian lives. Do we, do we think about what things have a long-term benefit? I mean, do we count the costs? Yeah. That's 
think there's one thing that a good CEO does, they have enthusiasm for what mm -hmm. they're pushing. And so many of, the, of us, and it's so easy, to, you might be enthusiastic, but you keep it wrapped up. Okay. I'm not sure Moses was all that enthusiastic when he got his call to be a CEO. <laughs> yeah. But he did a good job. He couldn't have been. Boy, he yeah, he certainly went all for it when he got into it. Well, I mean, living a Christian life could involve emotional suffering, social rejection, yeah. under unusual circumstances, maybe, maybe even physical torture, and certainly in some parts of the world, financial deprivation, imprisonment, and if history is to be repeated, death itself. I mean, let's. You well, but know, if, you we're know living, that if we're living. Um, uh, the Christian life that we're discussing here with the devotion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so th this is something we encounter every day. We're being persecuted every day. We're being what? Well, uh, then you're be, how, if you're how being, often are we having to make these kinds of yeah of choices here? If you're being persecuted every day for your faith, you're probably going the right direction. <clears throat> well, didn't we you, read a verse? You, that, you, when was the last it, time you were persecuted? Uh, that's that's what scares <laughs> scared me. I haven't been. I remember Emilio Connectly years ago. He says, "If you're not having problems, you're probably not going the right direction." I, that thing stuck with me for years. Now. What about Jesus? I mean, if <laughs> if, if we ha if we haven't got serious enough, what about this? Matthew 18, verses 8 and 9. If your hand or your foot makes you lose your faith, cut Good it up. off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life without a hand or a foot than to, be, than to keep both hands and both feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye makes you lose your faith, take it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with only one eye than to keep both eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Was Jesus serious when he said those things? Well, yes, he's serious. That's why he's just trying to make it serious. Okay. I mean, this is what the whole lesson is about, is that the gospel is a serious thing. I, I, I don't know if, I mean, we're kind of going at it as, as look at all the rough things that could happen to you, you know, and are you prepared? But I think Jesus, when he, how else can you portray that this is a serious thing? It's just like death is serious and it's going to happen to all of us. Well, there's some interesting verses that appeared close to the one I just read in the Gospels. That didn't get into this lesson, but I thought we ought to think about them. And one of them is Mark 10, starting with verse 28. Then Peter spoke up in response to all this. Look, we have left everything and followed you. I mean, isn't that, wouldn't that be, you know, if you're one of those disciples and there's Jesus, he says you should be leaving fathers and mothers and all this kind of stuff. Well, we've done it. Okay, so what, what's in it for us? Yes, Jesus said to them, and I tell you that anyone who leaves home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields from me and for the gospel will receive much more in this present age. He will receive a hundred times more houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, and persecutions as well. And in the age to come, he will receive eternal life. Okay, how does that fit? Well, That's usually we don't we don't hear the, those good benefits <laughs> when we read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Yeah. Well, it's got the bad stuff. They didn't get all those houses and lands and all of that other stuff. Is he... <clears throat> is he... I think it's the principle of the thing. I don't think we're required to go around chopping limbs off. In fact, in this day and age, you'd end up in the local psych tank and yeah. you'd be full of tranquilizers and then what good are you if that keeps up? Mm -hmm. I think it's more... I remember an elderly Korean nurse that I met when I first came to this country. Knew her quite well. When the North Koreans came down into South Korea, there was a knock on her door one night. She had four or five kids. Father was taken. They never heard from him again. The North Koreans took him. And this, you don't have to be a genius to figure out what happened. But they were known Christians. And uh, he was taken. That's it. Mm -hmm. The Nazis did it. The gulags did it. Yeah. We've never had anything like that, but we could in the end. Is Jesus just setting up this, 
wonderful goal way out there somewhere in the sky and he said aim for that and the closer you get the better but you know we know you nobody's going to ever really be able to do all that stuff what the the aim he was telling bearing the cross and chopping off your hands and you know giving up your family and I think he was making a fair comparison. He gave mm -hmm. up all to do what he did, and I think he's telling us you might have to too. Is it worth it to reach the place where we can see God face to face? I think so. Are you uh, anybody afraid of seeing God face to face? Well, you know those those questions are just words. Well, I, but they're, I just, they better I just be more than words. The depth doesn't come into it when you mm -hmm. just ask them those questions in those simple terms, for me anyway. Well, we say, and, and, and I'm, I'm trying to get you to take this serious. Well, so is Jesus. That's yeah. why he said all this stuff. Yeah, exactly. That's what I think that he, that's why I think he said all this stuff. We often say if something doesn't cost very much or if it's free, it probably isn't worth much. Yeah. I'm sure you've heard that before. Would that be true about Christian living? You only or value eternal if, life. Mm -hmm. We value it if you have worked for it. Mm -hmm. That's the same with getting to heaven. Well, Paul tried to give us some examples. Hebrews 11 is full of them. You know, starts out with Abel down to Abraham and Sarah and Dada, Enoch and all those. And clear down toward the end, he gets into some very interesting characters. Uh, Rahab and Jephthah and <laughs> some of those people. And down at the end, he says this. Look at, look at Hebrews eleven thirty two, going over to Hebrews 12, verse 4. Should I go on? There isn't enough for me, time for me to speak about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. Through faith, they fought whole countries and won. They did what was right and received what God had promised. They shut the mouths of lions. Put out fierce fires, escaped being killed by the sword. They were weak and became strong. They were mighty in battle and defeated the armies of foreigners. Through faith, women received their dead relatives back to life. Others, refusing to accept freedom, died under torture in order to be raised to a better life. Some were mocked and whipped, and others were put in chains and taken off to prison. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed by the sword. They went round clothed in skins of sheep or, go sheep or goats, poor, persecuted, and ill-treated. The world was not good enough for them. They wandered like refugees in the deserts and hills, living in caves and holes in the ground. What a record all of these have won by their faith. Yet they did not receive what God had promised, because God had decided on an even better plan for us. His purpose was that only in company with us would they be made perfect. As for us, we have this large crowd of witnesses around us. So then, let us rid ourselves of everything that gets in the way and of the sin which holds us onto us so tightly, and let us run with determination the race that lies before us. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from beginning to the end. He did not give up because of the cross. On the contrary, because of the joy that was waiting for him, he thought nothing of the disgrace of dying on the cross, and he is now seated at the right-hand side of God. Think of what he went through and so forth. I shouldn't take time to read on the rest of it, but that's pretty powerful language. By the way, in verse 35 there, it says, they're, they're going to receive a better resurrection. What's a better resurrection? Well, everybody gets resurrected, right? Yeah, but which is the better resurrection? Well, the one where you don't die again afterwards. <laughs> he goes up, <laughs> they go down. Yeah. I mean, he, Paul is saying, do you want to be part of the first resurrection? Or do you want to be part of the second resurrection? RSV says, rise to a better life. Yeah. So it, uh, but the, the real word is resurrection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you were just reading about faith there. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what pulls you through carrying the cross is the faith? Mm -hmm. If you didn't have that faith, why would you even do that kind of thing? Well, it, we, as we've mentioned earlier, we're now almost 170 years past 1844. And what's happened? Here's a couple of comments from what Ellen White and what's going to happen. Wickedness is reaching a height never before attained. 
and yet many ministers of the gospel are crying peace and safety. That's Acts of the Apostles, page 220. Then she says, let me tell you what's going to happen at the very end. Think about where you want to be when this happens. Fire comes down from God out of heaven. The earth is broken up. The weapons concealed in its depths are drawn forth. Devouring flames burst from every yawning chasm. The very rocks are on fire. The day has come that shall burn as an oven. The elements melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein are burned up. Malachi 4.1 and 2 Peter 3.10 The earth's surface seems like one molten mass, a vast seething lake of fire. It is a time of the judgment and perdition of ungodly men, the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. The wicked receive their recompense, their reward in the earth. They shall be stubble, and, they, and the day that come, cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, Malachi 4.1. Some are destroyed as in a moment, while others suffer many days. All are punished according to their deeds. Is that the resurrection we want to be a part of? That's great controversy, page 672 and 673. And it's a very interesting section to read. Start with 662 and read through about 680. The title of this particular lesson, The Cost of Discipleship, comes from the book, title of a book written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. What happened to Dietrich Bonhoeffer? I hung up on a piano wire in a Gestapo jail. He got, yes, he was killed in prison by the Nazis, basically. Here are some words that he said. The old life is left behind and completely surrendered. The disciple is dragged out of his relative security into a life of absolute insecurity. That is, in truth, into the absolute security and safety of the fellowship of Jesus, pages 62 and 63. If we would follow Jesus, we must take certain definite steps. The first step, which follows the call, cuts the disciple off from his previous existence, pages 66 and 67. The cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering which every man must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Pages 99. Page 99. Well, so what about that? That was somebody writing during the Second World War. He was, he was in jail. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. And he was killed. Very doesn't didn't look very good for him and so what do you do you and what was he doing in his discipleship that got him into that fix well he was a christian who who was preaching christian ideals he was also conspiring with a group of people to kill hitler yeah. so but he, that was an appropriate avenue of discipleship is to assassinate uh, hitler well, is it, is if it he hadn't have done that, would he have been ended up in? Was, uh, it's it's hard to know that. For, that's a good question. That he was one of the few Christians that openly challenged. Yeah. What was going on? Mm. And I think. Yeah, he said. I think he regretted he hadn't done more. Yeah, he did, openly. Yeah, yeah. So I should be on the steps of the White House complaining about things, or I should be up at. Uh, the state capitol, about some of the crazy things they're doing up there. I should be or, out at the church board or the school board. Or, or should I be living the very best Christian life I possibly can, discipling others whenever I have an opportunity, and bringing on the second coming of Christ? And then the state capitol and the White House won't matter anymore. Well... But, you know, I feel a calling to, I think they're making immoral, they're, the actions up there are hurting people. They're making, but Paul's example, some cases they're making immoral, unbiblical. Yeah. So I need to be up there and I need to... Hold on a minute. Uh, <laughs> Paul, Paul should be our example here, okay? Did he say <clears throat> slavery must stop? Did he say the Roman emperor, Nero, is a worthless guy that should be should be killed no he said we have a better we have something more important to do what is it it's spread the gospel. the gospel well jesus lived i mean let's be honest jesus lived in a very different time place and culture than we do 
Do we understand clearly what it means to be his follower in the 21st century? Are we prepared to live a life of service for him? After this series of lessons, is it clear in your mind what it means to be a disciple? Are you ready to live a life of discipleship and disciple makers? I mean, Jesus says that we should not only live the life of a disciple, we should be looking for every possible opportunity to help other people become disciples. Is this such a big task that it just overwhelms us? Well, what attracted people to Jesus? Was it his healing? A lot of people came for that. A lot of people came for the fish and the loaves. Mm -hmm. And, and he, when, he discouraged and when the, that. And, when, the, and when, when they found out the cost of discipleship, why well, they left. Well, what's the attitude in your town, in our town, toward the Adventist church, toward Christianity in general, toward religion in general? Are we correctly representing Christ? We know that many, many people in Jesus' day admired him. They were healed by him. They were prepared to make him a king. We know that. So why was he arrested and killed? Do we understand clearly what was involved in that whole process? Because that could happen again. Are you comfortable living a life of discipleship? Do you enjoy living a life of... Maybe you're doing it. Are you praying every morning for the opportunity to witness for God that day? If every Seventh-day Adventist were as active in the church as you are, would the church make progress? How long would it take for the gospel to be finished if every Adventist was as busy at spreading the gospel as you are? Am I to be praying for opportunities, or am I to be praying for how to handle those opportunities? Yeah. Both. Maybe both. Yeah, both. Well, it takes practice. It takes time, it takes commitment, it takes really believing that this is what we need to do, and it takes focus on Jesus. And there are, there are places in the world today where people are being persecuted and tortured and killed. Yep. Uh, so, could that happen to us? Absolutely. And we know that the time is coming when it's going to happen all over the world. Are we prepared? Are you ready to be a real disciple of Jesus Christ?